Okay, to introduce our next speaker, we have an old friend of the society here, actually going back to NSI days, former director of NSI from the late 70s. Uh, he's served for the, the uh, government in several positions, also served uh, numerous space ventures, GPS, remote sensing, uh, senior positions in the White House, Department of Transportation, Department of Commerce, uh, was the next chief of staff of NASA, and is currently serving the new administrator of NASA uh, as a senior advisor in the office of, of the administrator, helping Mike Griffin put together his team of leadership that's going to take NASA forward. I'd like to introduce to you the, the person who's going to introduce our speaker, our next guest speaker, Courtney Stapp. What a treat to follow uh, Jim Voss. Jim, you reminded me uh, why when you get caught up in these endless meetings and paper shuffling in the uh, headquarters, which is the bane of anyone who works in, in headquarters, really what it's all about. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, and I feel sorry for uh, those who can't join us in this lunch today because they have every right to be jealous to both have missed this gentleman's presentation and the fellow who's about to uh, join you here at the podium. If you're a junkie for passionate and highly talented people, you just got one fix, get ready for another one. Mark Cowan is an incredible storyteller who uses the medium of film as his special palette to lay bare the range of human experience. You don't passively watch a Mark Cowan production. He grabs you by the heart and occasionally by the funny bone and he takes you on a journey that is always memorable. Everyone I've asked who saw the very stunning uh, HBO series of a few years back, the Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg's uh, Band of Brothers series about the trials and tribulations of Easy Company in World War II, uh, recalls the stunning interviews that were interspersed during that series with the actual veterans of the 560th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment that accompanied that series. It was titled, We Stand Alone, and it represented a three-year effort, over 250 hours of interviews by Mark and his talented team. And not surprisingly, it received a 2002 Emmy Award nomination, and the interview material is now, thankfully, part of the permanent collection of the Library of Congress. During a nearly two-decade career in filmmaking, Mark has worked on more than 300 documentary projects and has been associated with Hollywood's top talent, Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, Sidney Pollack, Ron Howard, the list goes on and on. He's worked on a remarkable range of behind the scenes projects, including A Beautiful Mind, Men in Black, and Austin Powers. So say quite a range. Fortunately for all of us gathered today, Mark has harnessed his talents and what I can only refer to as his infectious passion, if you've ever been around Mark, for one of his great loves, the space program. And fortunately for all of us who care so deeply about the space frontier, the talents of Mark and his brother Chris and their team have been unleashed on yet another IMAX project. This one is called Magnificent Desolation, Walking on the Moon 3D, set to premiere this coming fall. And we are incredibly fortunate to have the movie's director give us his special insights into the making of that film. A quick side note, if I may, about a week or so ago, uh, the IMAX Corporation uh, leadership came by to visit with the administrator and when he was briefed on the plot line of this movie he uh, immediately signed up to uh, help support uh, the premiere and so forth because he saw immediately how it fit hand in glove uh, with the president's uh, vision. Now I ask all of you as we welcome Mark to be kind to him he's been living literally a 24-7 uh, existence in the editing suite room in fact, he tells me that even his dreams have time date stamps on them at this point. <laughs> um, and he's also coming to you straight from a red-eye flight from the West Coast. But please, welcome me and, and join me in welcoming a fellow space enthusiast to the podium. Yeah, if, if 
I fall asleep, just somebody come up here and nudge me. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, come here today. Um, uh, pardon me while I get some water here. I, have, I get terrible cotton mouth. Um, it's been about four years since we started on this project. And as Courtney said, and, and thank you for uh, your, your wonderful introduction, we um, finished the film, uh, I think, all of 37 hours ago, after four years. So uh, it's fresh in the mind, and I have to be honest with you, I haven't talked to anybody about this in four years, so I'm ready to go. Um, <laughs> so pardon me. Uh, it's, been, it's been very exciting, and, and pardon me, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna have to read uh, a, a, a fair chunk of my speech here. Um, with the theme of the conference being your ticket to space, I thought it might be interesting to share my own experiences on our journey into space. Our film, which will hopefully become uh, a part of the legacy of large format IMAX films, such as Space Station and Dream is Alive, um, our film is quite simply about the moonwalks. Although probably not how uh, IMAX wants us to sell the film, uh, we've just recently taken to trying to describe our film, because it is somewhat unique. And right now we're defining it as an experiential, large format, visual effects, hybrid, documentary film. And basically what that means is uh, we're pushing the boundaries of technologies to create, I hope, a truly unique, you are there experience for our audience in 3D. If the 3D effects in Creature from the Black Lagoon and it came from outer space had you reeling since 1954, fasten your seatbelts, because we hope that you'll be walking out of the theater dusting moon dust off your jacket. If, uh, if you don't feel like uh, that that's what happened, uh, then we did something wrong. The 3D in this film, I hope, will be uh, spectacular. Um, but first and foremost, we're telling an amazing story. One of, if not the greatest story, adventure story of all time. The goal of our film was to put the audience on the lunar surface and let them experience firsthand the Apollo moonwalks. I also have to pause for a second and let you know, I, because we, we finished so quickly uh, finished the film and I'm here. Someone else did the PowerPoint and, and, and I'm just praying to God that there's not space porn in there or something. <laughs> so I, if I keep glancing, you, you'll understand why. The biggest question we needed to answer before setting out to make this film about the moonwalks was, how can we look at this amazing accomplishment through new eyes and do it in a way that captures the emotion, the drama, and the humor of a truly human story. We decided to construct the film around several main creative building block components. Our first was our live action sequences. Our live action sequences basically means that we built a large chunk of the moon on a sound stage at Sony Studios, put actors and stuntmen in suits, flew them on wires to create, recreate one sixth gravity, and attempted to recreate unique moonwalk moments that perhaps we've forgotten about or just didn't know about. Our second component is the uh, lunar landscape backplates. Each of our live action shots with our actors uh, would be filmed against a green screen, allowing us to essentially paint in a specific geographic location that matches the specific moonwalk moment, pulling together the realism. However, instead of painting, what we did use were the actual Apollo photographs which uh, would be used as the main source for our background elements. Through the Space Act Agreement, NASA very, very kindly gave us access to the uh, high-res scans of the two and a quarter by two and a quarter Hasselblad photos, and they look absolutely amazing on the IMAX screen, which is 80 feet by 120 feet. You really do feel as if you were there when you almost step into these photographs. Um, the third component, are, uh, or the other component, sorry, uh, are the actual Apollo transmissions, which we're using to match up with our live action sequences. Now, supporting all of this live action, we've created sort of thematic montages using the kinescope and the 16 millimeter footage of the moonwalks. These montage sequences are gonna be used to help us expand the scope of our exploration of the lunar surface and to bring us just a bit closer to the men behind the visor. Now when you combine all these elements together, virtually every shot in the film becomes a visual effects shot. Now I'm a documentarian, 
uh, or at least I would like to consider myself a documentarian. And the notion of a visual effect shot just gets me running out the door. So making this film was uh, uh, truly a challenge uh, for all of us. Um, all of our visual effects shots uh, needed to be handled very carefully. Because it is an IMAX film and we are on a very, very large screen, each and every image, each and every frame needed to be handled in a 4K high res, resolution, uh, high, high, uh, high res environment. Meaning that we, uh, we used a lot of computers and uh, spent a lot of time trying to, uh, to make uh, the image look the best that we could. One of the strongest components of the film, I hope, is Tom Hanks himself. He's serving as the film's narrator and reading from a personally written script. Now I can tell you we recorded his voiceover the other day and yeah, he did an okay job. Uh, you know, as the director, I think I threw him for a loop when I was like, Tom, can you dig down deep and trying to do, do the narration in, uh, in 3D? And he just sort of looked at me like I was crazy. Um, but, you know, he's got the Academy Awards and he tried, you should have seen it. Besides Tom narration, we also decided to hang the narrative framework on our last building block component, which are quotes from the Apollo astronauts. Now, similar in sty style to uh, one of the Ken Burns films like The Civil War, we have noted Hollywood actors reading, from the script, uh, reading uh, throughout the film. Now, I'm not allowed to say who we got to do these voices, um, not just yet. But let me try and put it this way. Uh, the Apollo astronauts said that when they stood on the lunar surface and they looked up that they couldn't see the stars. Well, in this film, neither can you, but I can guarantee you that you'll be able to hear them. Uh, Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> and other people. Uh, all of our building block components uh, were inspired by two key sources. Now, for those of you that haven't visit, visited Dr. Eric Jones' uh, website, the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal, do so. Each and every moment of the moonwalks is transcribed and accompanied by photographs, audio files, and one-on-one, step-by-step -on -one, step interviews with all of the astronauts. It's truly remarkable. And if, if you're, pardon me, uh, sort of a space geek like me, you might as well just say so long to the wife and kids, log on to the journal, and then you know six weeks later sort of emerge from the glow of the computer and. Uh, uh, having walked through 16,000 pages of uh, what I think is some of the most amazing history known to man, uh, Dr. Jones was incredible and served as our navigator of all things EDA for the film. We also additionally have award-winning photographer and multimedia artist Michael Light, author of Full Moon. He's providing some of the imagery for our themed montages. Michael's really picked, I think, some of the most unique and not often seen images from the moonwalks. Um, and I think it's going to hopefully make the film stronger. Now, Courtney uh, gave you uh, an overview as to, to who I am. I just want to give you a little more some of Hollywood's top talent, and, and thankfully, not what uh, came across wonderful people like Tom Hanks, who gave me the opportunity to make projects like this. Yeah. It's been an interesting journey, this IMAX film, um, for all of us. Um, I mean, I'm a, a truly lucky person. I'm one of those people that I have a job, but it doesn't feel like a job. I love what I do. And to be given the opportunity to go into space and make a film is just too good to be true. And I'm still reeling from it. I can't wait for you all to see the film. I, I hope you like it. Um, in the last few years, I've been able to make some more traditional uh, documentaries, which is what, what led to this film. Uh, I was uh, done such things as uh, documentaries on uh, Haitian voodoo rituals. Uh, I did a documentary on the world of spying, and I even did a stint uh, as the producer of a reality show for Roseanne Barr. And amongst that, I also went to Nepal and, and did a, uh, an exploration search for the Yeti. I'm not sure which was worse to work with, the Yeti or Roseanne. I'm still out on that. But uh, uh, let's see, cut to February 2002. Um, my partner Mark Herzog and my brother Christopher Cowan were invited to uh, attend a test check screening of the IMAX version of Apollo 13. And Tom said, why don't you guys come along? The audience was completely blown away by the imagery they saw on the screen as well as by the possibility of being able to take IMAX technology and the 3D technology and perhaps make another space film on a new level. 
At the time, I was directing a documentary uh, about life on board an aircraft carrier, and I was floating somewhere off the coast of Pakistan uh, when I received an email delivered by the Department of Defense. And the email simply read, want to go to the moon? Tom. Well, that was the beginning of my journey, and that was almost, was almost four years ago. And since that time, we passed through creative and technological hurdles that it really took to make this film. Um, our audience, the IMAX audience is, is, is a curious one because anyone and everyone wants to see IMAX films. But the core audience really is younger. It's, 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 it's a lot of people going on field trips and, and learning what they can from these films. Um, and Tom said, you know what, l l let's try and make a film where we don't just heap facts and figures on, on top of one another. Let's, let's try and grab the audience by the seat of their pants and plant them firmly on the lunar surface. Let's try and do that. No small challenge. When we finally had Lockheed Martin on board as our sponsor, sponsor, thankfully, we flew here to DC to meet with the NASA folks, and Tom made it very clear to the people in the room what direction the film was going to take. He stood up and said, look, this film is not about pocket protectors, or is, nor is it about growing ice crystals in space. What we really want to do is some truly cool stuff. Tell the kids, you know, like how the astronauts peed on the moon. Dead silence in the room, six guys, all wearing pocket protectors, just not in my well, okay, if you want to talk. <laughs> we didn't do a uh, how-to uh, uh, sequence about the bathroom etiquette of our Apollo explorers, uh, but what we did do, I hope, is create a very accessible, very tangible film. And what we've attempted to do is humanize the experience um, and highlight the moments from the adventure that everyone can relate to and marvel at. Scripting this film, uh, was uh, an adventure unto itself. Uh, I wrote the film with Tom and with my brother Christopher. And uh, unlike a traditional narrative film where it was one guy who was in a room and he just starts tippy tappy on a typewriter or computer and voila, a script in here appears. We uh, needed to assemble a massive research team in order, in order to go through all 440 hours of EVA footage, all 7,000 plus uh, photographs from the walks, and to me, which was the biggest thing, just the plain scary amount of moon knowledge trapped in Tom Hanks' head. I mean, there's no way to explain it. There's absolutely no way to describe it. The man just breathes Apollo, and I'm not kidding. I mean, there's one day, all of our researchers were in a room, and it's, the session sort of turned into a warped version of who wants to be a moon millionaire, with Tom going toe-to-toe -to -toe on space facts with our research team. And uh, as the team slowly but surely began to you know, waste away their lifelines, Tom pulled out some amazing fact, uh, like that he knew the model number of the Teflon thread used to stitch on the patches of the Leva suits of Apollo 16. <laughs> uh, you think I'm kidding. I mean, it's, it's frightening how much he knows. I'm not even sure it's Teflon thread, but. Um, Tom Hanks' partner, Gary Getzman, and my partner, Mark Herzog, pulled together uh, a truly, truly remarkable team of Hollywood's elite to make this film. The best are always busy, and in Hollywood they get to pick what films they want to work on. On this project, all we had to do was pick up the phone and say, Tom Hanks, Moon, IMAX, and people were on board. Um, some of the people that we have, Sean Phillips, who's our director of photography, uh, not a name that you see in lights, but uh, many consider him to be, and he hates this moniker. He is the Da Vinci of 3D. This guy knows how to make things pop. Uh, he was fortunate enough to, we were fortunate enough to have him as uh, the lead person on our team, also supervising our visual effects. A fellow by the name of Charles Lee, who was our production designer and had to build the set and myriad other things. Uh, worked on all the 007 films in recent years. and was part of the Academy Award winning team that built and sank the Titanic. I asked him which was worse, uh, the Titanic or, or building the moon. And Charles, who is, is very, very British and takes his job very, very seriously. It just becomes a part of the mood, movie. When I asked him the question, he looked at me with a completely straight face and said, hmm, good question. Let me get back to you uh, after Splashdown. And he lived this movie. I mean, this guy would show up at four in the morning and just walk around the set and make sure that the, the boot prints and the dust looked just right. I mean, we were very fortunate. Uh, for your Star Wars enthusiasts, uh, Industrial Light and Magic's lead visual effects producer, John Knoll, 
I uh, was able to ask, um, ask Mr. Lucas uh, for a brief sabbatical between Star Wars and beginning uh, Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3 to come on board and he is producing a spectacular 3D computer generated version of Apollo 15's descent onto the plains of Hadley. We saw the first shots just the other day and it, it really is you are there. Last but not least, we were privileged to have as our astronaut consultant, Dave Scott, commander of Apollo 15. We worked with Tom on Apollo 13 and from Earth to the Moon. Dave was on the set each and every day, uh, providing detailed insight and was pretty much sure, uh, pretty much there to make sure that we weren't making some warped sequel to Capricorn 1. Uh, <laughs> When we began the film our, our, and had our team in place, construction of the sets uh, began and the search for Apollo props and set pieces commenced. Uh, I came up with a shopping list and I, I came to the team that goes out and finds all these things. I was like, okay guys, here's what we need. Um, I need one lunar module, preferably to scale and reel. I need, uh, I need a lunar rover, uh, used is okay, uh, low mileage though. Uh, I need six spacesuits, four large, one medium, and one portly small for me. <laughs> and oh, by the way, if you're out there and you have to come across like a magnetometer or an ALSAP barbell package, yeah, throw that in too. Oh, and by the way, we also need to build a future moon colony. And all of that, we need to do it in 3D. I mean, people's heads were spinning. You wouldn't have believed they scoured all over the place and found some of the most amazing Apollo era props and real artifacts that were used in the film. We had a really, really great production team. Uh, the week before, the first day of filming is always a little tense. And that's when the final big production meeting comes together. All the department heads come, Tom came, the IMAX folks came, and we all got in the room and we just went over each and every aspect of the film. We were gonna be shooting for 30 some odd days and our schedule was tight. As, as Jim said, shooting an IMAX movie is, is not easy, nor does it uh, happen at a, at a breakneck pace. We needed to make sure we had each and everything in place. Our team was excited, but nervous. And in that room, after I think it was a 13 hour meeting, our assistant director, who's sort of the cop of the, the production, uh, turned to the room and said, uh, okay guys, let's, let's, let's go around the room and just see where we stand department to department. So, camera department, and our director of photography paused for a second and we sort of looked at him over there. And Sean Phillips, our DP, paused, looked up and went, we're going to flight. Yeah. <laughs> Assistant director flung around and went, visual effects, go. Wardrobe, go. You know, all around, they came to me, director guy. And I had to pause, and I realized that this was my ticket to space. This was my one chance and I didn't want to screw it up. So I took a deep breath, and I looked at the room and just said, hell yeah, let's light this candle. <laughs> and with that, we took off, and uh, we launched, and it was, it was really great. The first day of shooting uh, was, was very special. I intentionally decided that I did not want to see the lunar surface set until the very first day of shooting. Uh, I just wanted to be able to see this moon surface with new eyes, with fresh eyes and treated as something special. So on the an early morning, just this past January, I, I drove onto the Sony Pictures lot and walked up to the, the massive doors of Stage 27. Now Stage 27 in LA is hallowed ground. It is where Dorothy walked on the Wizard of Oz, uh, walked on the Yellow Brick Road, and uh, it's also where uh, Esther Williams dove into a, a fire-ringed pool. Um, it's an amazing stage, it's gigantic, it's huge. And there I was. I actually, I actually wasn't sure I was gonna step on there. I, I, there was just this thing of knowing that I was going to the moon. When those doors opened up, there it was, it was the moon. And there sitting on its surface was a lunar module. And it's sort of glistening in our artificial sunlight. And from out of the shadows, two of our astronauts just bounded effortlessly in one six G towards me, lunar tongs in hand. I was on the moon. And without getting weepy, I gotta tell you, it was truly the dream come true. I mean, screw the major Matt Mason space crawler thing. I had the real thing. I was standing there 
Boys with toys. I got a lunar module. Come on, not many people can claim that. We were all very excited. The biggest hurdle to overcome in any IMAX film, as Jim said, is time budgeting. Just figuring out how to make this thing work and how to pull it all together. Now you got a camera the size of a refrigerator running two independent strips of film through a maze of spindles and sprockets. And on top of that, you have all the ocular convergence, convergence mechanisms that align the left eye and the right eye in order to create a 3D image. Uh, from the moment that you roll the first frame of film, as Jim said, you, you've got about, we had, our, I think our loads were buried, we had about two minutes. Had about two minutes of film that we could roll. But because our camera was bigger, we had bigger, roll, different, bigger rolls and a bigger camera, uh, it actually took us almost two hours between shots. It took that long to reload the camera. So on average, uh, in Hollywood where you get 10 to 12 shots a day, we were averaging about two. And at first we thought, God, are we, are we actually gonna make this thing? I don't know what's gonna happen. But once we started to see the dailies and everybody calmed down, we sort of got into the IMAX flow of things, we realized that it was gonna be a, a pretty spectacular uh, opportunity for all of us to make something unique. But mishaps do happen. And uh, that was very much the case with our rover. Uh, the kind folks at the Kansas Cosmosphere lent us a near complete rover. The rover arrived in just spectacular shape, except for the fact that the electric motor had never been fully rigged to work. I mean, we, we had guys spending days trying to rig up this elaborate system of pulleys in order to drag the rover across the lunar surface. And trust me, it looked like some sort of bad version of uh, moon version of like Dukes of Hazard. It just it, it looks <laughs> god awful. But we were shooting a movie on a Hollywood motion picture studio lot, and on motion picture studio lots, the uh, the favorite mode of transportation for the executives are these tricked out golf carts that they scoot around in on their way to their power lunches. So somebody had the ingenious idea of like, why don't I have a golf cart? There's got to be someone around that can look at this thing and figure it out. So. Somebody went over and found the head mechanic to the golf cart motor pool. <laughs> and this guy kind of swaggered over and he looked at it. And surprisingly, in about an hour and a half, he had this thing up and running and uh, truly running like a Ferrari on Red Bull. I mean, it was, it, you know, it was supposed to go like 12 miles an hour, it was going like 30. And then, you know, pull it back just a bit. The very first time that we got it running, pardon me, the very first time that we got it running, you know, there were about eight of us standing in the alleyway, the sun was just setting. And this rover is just streaming down the alleyway, all happy as be. And this mechanic kind of walked up, wiping his hands from the grease. And he, and he just looked at me and went, pretty sweet. <laughs> pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, isn't it? And he went, yeah, now what the hell is that thing? <laughs> the stuntmen were actually the heroes, our heroes of the set. These guys spent hours on end hanging from a quarter inch wire in order to recreate a oh, there it goes. Knew it was gonna happen. That's okay. Anyway, um, uh, these guys were uh, amazing. They had to wear full spacesuits, hanging from a wire, and then one day one of the um, temperature control packs went out on one of our suits, and the temperature in suit just skyrocketed to something insane. And I, I saw our stuntman just sweat pouring off his face. I could actually see it through the visor. And I walked up and said, hey, look, you know, why, don't we, why don't we take you off the wire for a while, just you know, take you out of the suit and just let you, you know, catch your breath. And this guy, Scotty, looked at me, and these are stuntmen, right? Popped up his visor, looked at me and said, did they ever take Neil out of the suit? <laughs> Popped his visor down. Bounced off after his land. I was like, oh, there you go, we get our shot. <laughs> At times, we all felt like astronauts, just standing there on our fake moon. There were moments, though, when the light would hit just right on the stage, and it actually felt like you could see off for miles, standing in Tranquility Base and that desolate horizon. And I wondered what it must be like for Dave Scott, standing there back on the moon again, perhaps. I was wondering what was going through his mind. And one night, uh, it was about midnight, and we had uh, you know, whittled our 175 person crew down to about 10 people in order to just get one last shot. And the shot was, was very simple. Just lunar surface, lem off, 
about 50 yards away. And what I wanted was just a, a solo set of moon boot prints heading to the ladder. So we were about ready to strap the, the booties onto one of our burly prop men. When I saw Dave just standing out of the corner of my eye, and I sort of sashayed up and just said, uh, would you mind leaving some footprints for old time's sake? Dave, if anybody knows Dave, just smiled and nodded in the way that only Dave Scott can nod, and he just did one of these. He went, <laughs> don't mind if I do. <laughs> he sat down, slipped the moon booties over his street shoes, and with the stride of a true Apollo explorer, bounded toward the land. And when he reached the ladder, Dave turned, looked to the group, smiled, and said, just like riding the bike. <laughs> The Apollo astronauts all made it look very, very easy, flying to the moon, walking on its surface, and making discoveries for the whole world to share. This is hopefully what our film is about, the adventure. We are going to the moon on September 23rd, and I hope that you will all join us. I truly enjoyed sharing my experiences with you. I apologize for spilling water. I apologize for being a bit sleepy. Um, uh, but thank you for letting me, me, me come and talk about this. I applied, applaud all of you who are developing and supporting citizen space travel for the future. Question is, should we, should the common man be given the opportunity to grab a ticket to space? I say, hell yeah, let's light this candle. Thank you. I'd be more than happy to answer it. Hi, Loretta. I just saw you stand up there. How are you? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for the animation of the whole story. Uh, I, I realize I don't have anymore. I don't know why. So that, yes, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as somebody of your age who uh, was, there, you know, was there to see it, I wonder, you know, and obviously I'm sure that a lot of the crew and so forth were people who came after or were younger. Yeah. You know, was there, was there that gap between those who had, the question is, uh, our crew, which clearly was made up of uh, people of the Apollo and pre-Apollo era, and those who, when you said Apollo, actually went, huh? Um, everyone was excited about space. Everyone was excited about space and the possibility of it. In Hollywood, to work on a, a moon movie is, is truly unique. I will have to admit, though, I would say only about 0.005% of the crew actually knew anything about Apollo. Actually, to tell you quick, I was just telling Courtney this. One of the sequences in the film that we did, um, we decided we wanted to do one of those like kind of man on the street interview type things just to see what kids knew about uh, the moon. And uh, I, good news is they knew a lot. That was the great news. But when we asked them just a few simple questions, we got some truly remarkable uh, and, and somewhat interesting inter uh, questions. Uh, the very first boy that walked up said, uh, walked up, and I said, hey, listen, let me just ask you a question. He was probably like seven, eight. I said, so who was the first man on the moon? Who was the first man to walk on the moon? And this kid went, oh, 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 Arm Armstrong, Lance Armstrong. <laughs> We got some pretty interesting, uh, uh, pretty interesting. The other, the other question that we asked, which my, my favorite one, which I don't think it's in the film anymore, which was, how did the astronauts go to bathroom in space? And you have a thousand answers. This one tiny little boy just walked up and went, they held it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. As the, uh, as, as the IMAX folk will tell you, uh, four years ago, one of the first things that Tom Hanks said was, we're making a movie, but we're also making a school curriculum. This film needs to be supported uh, uh, by all education materials that we can. So IMAX, which obviously through the, the amazing uh, space legacy of films that they, they have, uh, there is a huge educational component that will be behind this, this, this program. Uh, behind this film, and it's something that Tom is actively involved in, it's something that I'm going to be actively involved in throughout the release of the film, and um, yeah, it's, it's education, education, education. I mean, it's, it's why we're making the film. I mean, granted, 
as I said, we don't have a lot of facts and figures in this film because what Tom really wanted to do was, you know, give the next generation a kick in the pants and go, hey, look, space, moon, stars, let's go. And um, hopefully that's what we did. So education will be a huge part. Yes. Okay. So two questions, maybe related. Uh, what's next for you? And when can we expect to see something like this on Mars? Uh, it's a, uh, something on, oh, Mars. on Mars. Good, good question. Uh, uh, what's next for me? Sleep. Um, uh, uh, what's next for me? Space. I'm staying in space. Uh, m my goal is to uh, do another project with Tom uh, about space and to do it with some, some good friends who have found a, I think, truly one of the most unique space stories uh, that is yet to be told. Um, it'll be a documentary. It'll be a documentary feature. Um, that'll probably come out within the next year. Uh, there is a, a large format Mars film in the works. I keep hearing rumors about. Uh, and if I have anything to do, it, uh, do with it, um, I'll go out and make the Mars movie get out there first. So we would love to. We actually want to do a huge uh, Mars uh, component in this film. And very early on, we decided, you know what? Let's 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 stay with the moon. Let's let's stay focused here. And uh, part two will be be Mars. I'd love to do it. Yes, sir. You said something about a moon calling. Yes. That's a good question and a top secret. Yeah, it's um. Ah, oh boy. How do I? How do I? Do, how do I? Uh, we know we're going to the moon. And Tom said, if we're going to the moon, let's build a colony. And put it up there for everyone to see. It may not be the most accurate thing in the world, but it's going to sit up there. And I can tell you this: what's very exciting is when we started to, to, to script, oh, yeah, let's build a future moon colony. What are we going to do there? God, boy, I'm, having not told this, there's a surprise ending. There's a surprise ending, uh, ending uh, featuring one of the people that appears in the film who um, appears in the future uh, on the moon. And uh, it's kind of exci it's a, an exciting thing. It looks very cool, I have to tell you. Uh, we had. You know, everybody and their brother had opinions on what the future colony should look like. Um, and uh, in turn, I think we came up with, with something that's really, really pretty good. Yes? I heard a rumor that members of the National Space Society will be given a first uh, cut in the line for the <laughs> There you go. There you go. Look, I, I can tell you this. Uh, when we roll this film out in, in September, um, uh, Megan Down, who's here from IMAX, we're doing everything we can to put this film in the hands of the people that know how to treat it and know how to fan the fire, if you will, and let people know about it. So, you know, you, you work on it. You work on it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, yes. No, I haven't. I'm dying to. I, yeah, you know, I was looking over here going, it's like, well, you know, I'll hang around. Um, yes, no, I, I listen, I worked on Apollo 13. This is a real quick story. I worked on Apollo 13. I did the, uh, the behind-the-scenes documentary and the four or five different TV specials related to the release of the movie. And, uh, you know, Ron Howard and Tom and these guys were all getting ready to go down, you know, to go on the zero G, you know, to do their, 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 their thing and to film it. And I'm sitting there one day, and Ron goes, you know, you're Mark, you should... You should be there. This needs to be documented, dude. It's got to be there. You got to be. You got to come. So I went through the training. I was so dang excited. I got there, and they said, "You know what? We just we have too much weight on the plane." Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'll work out. I swear I'll lose weight. You know, it was like, but I didn't get to go. I was that close, and it just pain. I mean, I love Apollo 13, but it pains me to see those weightless scenes because I'm like, God, I should have been there. <laughs> Uh, yes, nice question. Uh, you mentioned the 23rd of September. Is that going to be opening nationally, or is it going to be a premiere somewhere and then go down? Uh, it's, it's actually opening nationally, uh, and I think worldwide? Is it worldwide? What worldwide on the 23rd. Grand premiere like the there will be. On, uh, yes, the um, uh, Lockheed uh, Martin is, uh, uh, I guess, the, behind the premiere, which is on the 21st here at the, at the National Air and Space Museum. I mean, good Lord, I am bouncing off the walls. I mean, usually our, our you know, documentary premieres are like in a garage in West Covina. So <laughs> this, is, this is too good to be true. It's too good to be true. 
listen, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. And again. What a, what a great presentation. Just can't wait for September to come around. Mark, thank, thank you very much. And a token of our appreciation on behalf of the National Space Society. Thank you so very much. We can't wait. Thank, thank you very much. Right. And please invite me back when I'm a little more awake. Oh, we will. Thank we you. will. Thank you very much, everybody. On to the afternoon and on to the gala tonight. Make sure you pick up your bus tickets. <laughs>